coup, on vient de passer les 18h30, donc je pense qu'on va, on va commencer. Euh, donc, je m'appelle Liane Persson, je fais partie des organisateurs euh, de la conférence de, de cette année. Euh, je prends juste la parole quelques minutes, vraiment pas très longtemps au début, euh, essentiellement pour des remerciements. Euh, J'ai plusieurs types de personnes à remercier, en fait. Euh, déjà, vous remerciez, euh, vous, public, parce que euh, l'an dernier, on a fait un petit euh, pari en, en lançant une conférence euh, différente de ce qui pouvait exister euh, sur le, le reste de la place. Euh, vous aviez répondu présent avec euh, une, 150 personnes qui étaient venues. Euh, cette année, on a mis euh, beaucoup plus de places à, enfin, à disposition et euh, elles ont toutes été, euh, pas vendues, mais, euh, mais données parce que cette année, on, on fait un événement qui est complètement gratuit. Euh, C'est un plaisir de voir que là, il y a déjà 130 personnes qui sont connectées. Euh, donc, merci à vous d'assister à cette première soirée. Euh, merci aux speakers. Euh, un petit peu comme l'an dernier, on a eu énormément de, de gens qui ont fait des propositions de talk. Euh, C'est toujours extrêmement difficile de choisir. On a essayé de faire que ce soit super varié pour que vous puissiez avoir un, un éventail de présentations autour du test le, le plus large possible. Euh, merci aux animateurs. Euh, au contraire de l'an dernier où on était juste euh, l'organisation, cette année, on a ouvert un petit peu les les portes euh, et les personnes qui vont vous présenter euh, les talks euh, sont des gens qui euh, ont fait l'effort de le faire. Donc, euh, un grand merci à eux. Et puis, un euh, ben, merci aux autres organisateurs euh, qui, euh, certains sont là, certains ne sont pas là ce soir, mais euh, c'est grâce à eux, en fait, que cet événement peut avoir lieu. Donc, un, un grand merci. Um, just a few words in English. Um, to say thank you, uh, thank you to you, uh, the audience, uh, to be there tonight. And uh, and it's a bit crazy to see that um, we had like hundreds uh, of uh, seats uh, tonight available, and all of them were um, uh, taken basically for free. Um, so it's pretty great. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to the people who are going to present the talk uh, tonight and during the, the next uh, evenings. And uh, obviously, uh, thank you to the organizer also, uh, the people who are here uh, along the year to just prepare this, uh, these evenings. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, Benjamin will be handling uh, tonight everything. Uh, he will be the one managing the, the different talks and uh, he will be the one introducing you to the first uh, Awesome speaker of tonight, uh, Lisa. Merci Yann. Bonsoir tout le monde, ravi d'être là avec vous euh, ce soir. Je bascule en français très rapidement. Euh, pour, euh, bah oui, je serai votre animateur pour, pour ces trois, trois talks de la soirée. Et je rebascule immédiatement en anglais puisque notre premier talk est en anglais. So, hi folks, uh, before starting the first talk, uh, you have to know that this talk is recorded. Its duration is uh, between 30 and 40 minutes, plus 15 minutes Q&A. Uh, don't worry, your video and your microphone are off. That's totally normal. Um, if you want to discuss um, uh, between us, use the chat. And if you want to ask question to the speaker, you have uh, Q&A tools in Zoom. Use it. All questions asked in the chat will not be response. Okay, only once using the Q and the Q and A tools in Zoom. Um, Zoom also lets you to uh, choose your display, so you can see the slide ways and the video of the speaker at the same time. And um, the slide ways and videos will be uh, available in the next few days if you want to share uh, it to your colleagues or your friends. Our first talk uh, is a. Uh, with uh, Liza Crispin. Uh, Liza uh, is uh, a fan, uh, a very big lover about uh, donkeys. She's got uh, several donkeys uh, in her farm uh, in the, the Vermont. But she's not here tonight to speak about her donkeys. <coughs> she's here tonight to uh, speak about testing. And Liza is a very great tester in the world testing community. She's quite famous. She uh, wrote several books. Uh, one of them is Agile Testing. I uh, read it uh, last year and it's a very great book. If you don't read it yet, just buy it and read it. It's a very good book about Agile Testing. And tonight, 
She's, uh, she will speak about agit testing principles and modern testing principles. Liza, are you, are you with me? Do you want me? I'm ready. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen. And you can share yours, I guess. Okay, everyone can okay. see that? Yes, I can see it. Okay, so see you later and good time. <laughs> Sounds good. Ah, je commence avec quelques mots en français. Bonsoir. Je suis tellement honorée de participer à cette conférence. Merci pour l'invitation. Aujourd'hui, je vais partager des idées sur les principes qui guident le testing en Agile et DevOps. Comme j'ai le privilège d'être la première présentatrice, j'espère qu'on peut continuer à discuter, discuter ces idées pendant les trois jours, trois so soirs qui viennent. And now, as you can see, that my French is not good enough to keep going in French, I shall proceed in English. I've been lucky to work on mostly small cross-functional teams for the last 20 years where we all pitched in on all the activities around testing and the whole DevOps loop. I've been a hands-on tester on these teams for 20 years and more, and I've been lucky to collaborate with Janet Gregory on several books and courses. Our latest book is a very small one, Agile Testing Convinced. I would suggest starting with that if you want to read one of our books. And my current day job is on the quality team at OutSystems. And in my free time, obviously, I spend time with my donkeys here on our farm in Vermont. This is what I'd like to talk about today. The 10 principles for agile testers are from me and Janet from our first book, Agile Testing. The modern testing principles are from Alan Page and Brent Jensen from their A-B testing podcast. I listened to Alan and Brent over the course of a, of a couple of years worth of episodes where they formulated their modern testing principles. I do recommend listening to those podcast episodes because what I'm gonna present you today may seem in some way shocking or, oh, that doesn't make sense. If you get the full context of how they formulated the principles, you can understand them better. I'm not saying they're for everybody anyway. I'm going to explain both sets of principles and talk about how they relate to each other and how they can benefit your team. So we're going to start with the agile testing principles. And you can see that I like donkeys and Janet likes dragons. So that's why we have both. So we introduced these principles in our first book, which was published in 2010. And back then, 10 years ago, many testers were still part of a siloed, separate testing team working in a more waterfall style methodology. And so this mindset shift to testing being a continual process, part of software development, not a phase tacked on at the end, was new. And the concept was very difficult for a lot of people. So we have these principles on our Quick Tools for Agile Testing free download handout, which is on our agiletester.ca website. I've got links at the end for that. And it's available in many languages, actually. And over the years, we've gotten really positive feedback from people who found good guidance in following these. And just as testing and quality are the responsibility of the whole delivery team, these principles really apply to everyone on the team. Everyone participates in at least some testing activities and building quality in. So I, I think today we would have called these simply 10 agile testing principles. Provide continuous feedback, deliver value to the customer, enable face-to-face -face communication, that's virtual these days, have courage, keep it simple, practice continuous improvement, respond to change, self-organize, 
focus on people, and most of all, enjoy. I do have these in French. I'll let you read those yourselves for a minute. Uh, like I say, we, we put together this little quick tools for agile testing and lovely friends of ours around the world have translated them into oh, at least a dozen languages now. So those are downloadable. So I'd like you to stop for a moment and just consider these principles. Are there any principles here you're already applying in your work and on your team? Or are there some that seem useful? Or are there some that you're puzzled about or not sure how you would use them? So I'd like if you feel comfortable sharing those in the chat, and I have to go find the chat again because I can't see it right now. Uh, but I'd love you to share this with each other. Just take, I'm going to set my timer. Just take a couple minutes because it's boring for me to just talk all the time. Um, just go ahead and share those. Set my timer and search around. I can see, I can see people, but I can't see the chat. Let's see. So does anybody have anything to share? And feel free to put them in French. I can read French much better than I can speak it. Oh, can we call the question? Just any of those principles, are you already doing, using any of those principles? Uh, or do any of them seem interesting? You'd like to try them? Continuous feedback, definitely. That's, that's very established in most Agile teams. Uh, responding to change, yeah, it's, it's hard to track. Uh, very good point. Simple doesn't mean easy, right? Okay, well, good. Benjamin's using them every day. What do you mean by have courage? Well, for example, if you've never worked together with developers, maybe you never paired with them or collaborated with them, that can be difficult. Or just delivering bad news in the form of, oh, I found a bad bug. You need courage sometimes. So yeah, feedback, keep it simple. Enjoy, yay. We forget about that sometimes. Oh, focus on people, enabling face-to-face. -face. Yeah, a scrum master, that's a good, a good way scrum masters can help. Yeah, yeah, keep it simple to, to remove impediments. Responding to change, right? The Kent Beck's first book, uh, Stream Programming Explained, was subtitled Embrace Change. Yeah, trust, trust is really important. We didn't really include that, but I think that's really central, it's that psychological safety on your team. All right. Okay, great. Well, I'm so glad to see so many people already embracing these. Uh, move, oops, just chat out of the way. All right. So let's move on to the modern testing principles. And these, again, these are from the podcast, AB Testing, that they've been doing for some years now. And you can go to moderntestingprinciples.org and, and get to their podcast episodes. So in the past couple of years, they were thinking about principles for testing in our modern world with continuous delivery, continuous deployment. And they liked Janet's and my books and found them a good basis, but they felt the need for more, for new skills. So for example, in the past few years, We've seen an explosion of big data and artificial intelligence and data science skills would help us analyze. Just, now we can get vast amounts of data about how our customers actually use our product or what problems they're running into. So that's an example of a skill they see as valuable. And they want testers, Janet and I felt that testers should act as consultants on the team, help people learn about testing, transfer skills, Alan and Brent see it even more as a coaching role, helping everybody uh, on the team learn to test and build quality in. So they settled on these principles. And again, on my resources slide at the end, there's a link to a webinar by Melissa Eden, 
where she talks about how to pr the practical application of these modern testing principles. So I'm going to explain them in a little more detail, but you'll see there's a lot to them. So I can't really cover them in as much depth as Melissa does. But it sounds like there's going to be as familiar to you as the agile testing principles. So Brent and Alan, I've got to close my shade because suddenly the sun came out. Whoops. Sorry about that. It was raining earlier. OK. Um, Alan and Brent talk about testing as accelerating the delivery of shippable quality. I love that phrase. And they talk a lot about us testers being the safety net. So how many of you have kind of heard developers on a team say, hmm, yes, Lisa's an excellent tester, Emna's an excellent tester. They will catch any bugs that I put in. I don't need to worry about testing. And so they just crank out their code and, and throw it over the wall. And they compare this to the expertise of circus acrobats. So if you're a tightrope walker and you have a safety net and your skills are not so good, you may fall, but you won't die because there's a safety net. And that's the same as, as developers thinking, hmm, the testers will take care of me. What if I stop being the safety net? What happens? Um, well, we don't want anyone to die, but we can lower the tightrope. We can enable a more learning environment where, test, where developers can learn skills like test-driven development, pair programming, um, behavior-driven development, exploratory testing, things that will help them build quality in. We just have that tightrope where if they fall, it won't hurt. And then over time, and they get more expert, they can go higher. So we can safely raise the tightrope, but we're working together rather than acting as a safety net. So these are the first three of their principles. I'll just let you read. Well, I can read them. Our priority is improving the business. We accelerate the team and use models like lean thinking and theory of constraints to help identify, prioritize, and mitigate bottlenecks from the system. We are a force for continuous improvement, yay, helping the team adapt and optimize in order to succeed rather than providing a safety net. We care deeply about the quality culture of our team, and I think a lot of you can probably relate to that. We coach, lead, and nurture the team towards a more mature quality culture. We believe that the customer is the only one capable to judge and evaluate the quality of our product. That's one of the principles I've seen people debate the most. Like, mm, is it, isn't there anybody besides the customer who should judge this? I'll let you think about that. We use data extensively to deeply understand customer usage and then close the gaps between product hypotheses and actual business impact. And this is perhaps the most controversial one that I've heard people react to. We expand testing abilities and know-how across the team, understanding that this may reduce or even eliminate the need for a dedicated testing specialist. How do you feel about that one? So this is a lot of reaction people get. They're like, what? What? Work myself out of a job? Um, so I'm curious, and we'll pause for a minute. I'm just curious if any of you have a, a reaction to that, to that idea of we should be so good at teaching other people on our team our testing skills that they won't need us anymore. Anybody? Uh, ah, see, everyone's responsible for quality and contest. Some people love that, yeah. Is it the same for all jobs? That's an interesting thought. I hadn't really thought about that, Alicia. Yeah, we'll be needed in other teams for sure. We're not going to be out of work. But a specialist helps to stay on the road. I agree. I agree. Scrum master's job? Yeah, if, you, if you're working in Scrum and you have somebody in that leadership position, it's really helpful. Any other thoughts? Others say testing boring. Yeah, if you have something like manual regression checklists, nobody's going to want to do that. Um, automating tests to the UI level, sometimes that's a job nobody really wants to do. Um, yeah, not being a gatekeeper, that's really, really important. 
Still need a QA coach for the team. Mm -hmm. I'm actually with you on that. Do uh, we hear all the time test developers like where I work? A lot of developers say, "Well, I'm happy to do the unit test, but everything else the tester should do." Um, yeah, shift left and right is interesting. Testers are always good to have. So, what is a dedicated testing specialist in an agile team? That's a good question. A teacher will not go out of a job. We would be there. Yeah, yeah. I I actually agree with you. Um, I agree. I and I think it really depends on your business domain, right? Because, um, you know, if you're working uh, a couple teams ago, we were creating an online project tracking tool. Well, if our tracking tool goes down, probably no lives will be lost. But if I were working on medical software or uh, rocket ship software, I may feel like we need lots and lots and lots of testing specialists. So I think it's context dependent. So I'd like to talk some about how Janet's and my agile testing principles relate to the modern testing principles. Because after Ellen and Brent came out with them, people, people asked us about them and we just like, hmm, yeah, they're different, but we think they have some things in common. So let's explore these one by one. Continuous feedback. Y'all talked a lot about that in the chat, which is awesome. And we need that for continuous improvement. Short feedback loops are even more critical for teams moving towards continuous delivery and deployment. And Janet and I have long encouraged practices like pairing and mob programming or ensemble programming, which I prefer to call it nowadays, um, because those give the shortest possible feedback loops. You're right there together. And those help with the modern testing principle one, improving the business, and modern testing principle three, be a force for continuous improvement. Providing feedback is something we are really good at as testers, so do it as quickly as you can. My first choice is always to show the developers as soon as I see an issue or to have a question. And if I have to, I'll put it into a defect tracking system if I'm concerned we may forget about it before we fix it. I've been lucky to do a lot of pairing with developers in previous jobs, and that really helped us prevent bugs even from getting into the code that gets committed to the source code repository. We, we found those as they were developing, and they learned testing skills by pairing with me. Focus on delivering value to the customer supports the idea that the customer judges the product's level of quality. Now, some people may say, oh, well, some of this is the business decision. Some people may say, well, some of these technical concerns like security, those really are more the concern of the team. The customer can't judge it. So I think there could be a lot of debate about that. But because of today's technology with our monitoring and observability, we can learn really quickly on all the analytics we have. We can learn what customers think of our product or how they use our product just by looking at their production use. We can follow their user journeys. And we have to remember that our products usually have more than one customer persona or role. People with different jobs or, or people with different personalities are using our product. Also, we may have both internal and external customers that we have to satisfy. So this supports principle number five from the modern testing principles that only the customer can judge and evaluate the quality of our product. Um, you know, when my own teams have done our pre-iteration planning meeting, our, our three amigos meetings, if you will, where we have a business person, a tester, a developer, maybe a designer, other, and a couple other people there too. The first question we ask for each epic or, or feature or story we're going to work on is why? What's the purpose? We want to focus our testing on what is valuable. So we feel like the deliver value to customer uh, principle relates to the modern testing customer is king and data trumps intuition. We're going to work off data, not our feelings.
face-to-face -face communication, which may be via video now, is the most effective way testing practitioners can accelerate the team and encourage continuous improvement. We don't want to get in the way of conversations, for example, between uh, somebody on the development team and somebody on the some business stakeholder, but we want to facilitate it, bring people together. We One of our superpowers, I think, is knowing who needs to talk to each other and getting those people together. And it's a key component in building a culture of quality. So we can do remote pairing and mobbing or ensemble work very effectively with our tools. And, uh, and you know, even with my job, it's not a culture where they're used to pairing or working in an ensemble, but usually people can spare 30 minutes or an hour to pair with me if I ask. So, so again, this relates to the modern testing principles of no bottlenecks, always learn and improve, lead a quality culture. It's very congruent here. So having courage. Um, so it takes courage to push back and stop acting as a safety net for developers. Um, on my couple teams ago, uh, when we were working on this web-based project tracking tool, we were really having trouble because even though we had automated thousands of tests, we had a, a checklist of things to do manually before each release or each deploy to production. And it was taking so much time. And finally, the we testers said, you know what, we're not doing this anymore. If somebody else wants to do it, they can. We're not doing it. And Interestingly, we never had any bugs that we would have found on that manual checklist. So, but it took courage to say that. And the modern testing principle number seven takes courage as well. You know, who wants to work themselves out of a job that they love doing? So we believe that in most domains, dedicated, spe dedicated spe testing specialists will continue to be needed. And at the same time, it's clear that teams where quality is left to a few specialists will not perform well. So I've fallen into the trap, maybe some of you have done this too, of, I was so concerned about a deploy we were about to do, releasing a big feature maybe, that I worked late or I worked over the weekend, but none of the coders were doing that. So this is a problem to bring to the whole team to solve. So we need courage and everyone can test. How does simplicity relate to the modern testing principles? It's not so obvious to me. Um, and, the, and in fact, I, I found that a lot of people, when they first read the modern testing principles, they, they feel overwhelmed. So it's important to start simply here, one small step. So if there's a modern testing principle that looks useful to you, just take one small step along that road toward embracing them. And, and again, we all talked a lot about simplicity. So uh, something, a, a big value for you, uh, but it can be one of the hardest principles to implement. So if you have an idea, propose a simple experiment. So just to give an example, uh, my team back at this project tracking tool team, we experienced long cycle times and high rejection rate. We would deliver a story to the product owner and the product owner would say, that's not what I wanted, do it over. I had just learned about example mapping from Matt Wynn. And so I asked people if they would spend 30 minutes with me and I showed them how to do example mapping, which is an activity you can do in your three amigos or pre iteration planning meetings to go through each story, identify the goal, the business rules, some concrete examples to illustrate the business rules. And they liked the idea and I proposed that we experiment with it in our next pre iteration planning meeting. It was a simple technique, it worked well, we kept doing it, our cycle time came down, our rejection rate came down. One step at a time, as my friend Ashley Hunsberger says, don't try to boil the ocean. I'm sure there must be a saying in French like that. Continuous improvement is a principle shared by both lists and it's a core practice for any team wanting to embrace agile and DevOps culture and become a higher performing team. So this is where our retrospectives are really valuable. Not our job as testers to facilitate them, but I find that I really enjoy facilitating them. And also I like practicing my facilitation skills. Those are really important to me as a test consultant. Um, so offer to facilitate retrospectives. Uh, and that's a really valuable way for teams to improve. So this agile testing principle 
uh, goes with the modern testing principle to always learn and improve. Responding to change, it's an integral component in continual improvement. And in my experience, the only way to improve it is identify the biggest problem in our way, make it visible, design a small experiment to chip away at that problem, make it a little better, measure progress or lack of progress, either way we learn something, and iterate with changed or new experiments. So when my team was having trouble getting a passing build every day in our continuous integration, we started, this is back in the days of co-location in an office, we put a big red sign on our physical task board whenever the build was failing and it agreed that when we saw that red sign, it was the top priority of the team, unless there was a production outage, to get the build working again. Of course, you can do this remotely as well, the, the virtual equivalent of a big red sign in your project tracking tool or, or your IDE or your Slack, whatever. Um, so, so responding to change relates to the modern testing principles, always learn and improve, and data trumps intuition. Now we hope all teams self-organize around their mission to deliver a quality product and solve, that solves customer problems, which really relates to all the modern testing principles. Teams that learn the business domain in particular and focus on how they can provide more customer value, maybe with less work, are more likely to be successful. The highest performing team I've been on, we started off with complete chaos, but we learned to self-organize. We had a good coach, a good leadership. We focused on finishing one thing at a time. We used our retrospectives. We discussed problems together. We agreed on small experiments to try. If we had a mini waterfall going on where our testing was all squeezed to the end of the two week sprint, we made a new rule for ourselves that make sure one story is finished by the second day of the sprint so we can start doing additional testing. So this relates to the modern testing lead a quality culture principle number four. And we know that it's people, not tools or methodologies that ultimately make teams and their products successfully. So we've had numerous academic studies as well as our own experiences to prove this. So focus on people really applies to every one of the modern testing principles. So one of the scientific studies that impacted me early in my career was from Alistair Coburn. And his study showed that the first order factor correlated to project success is the people, having good people allowing them to do their best work. It didn't matter what programming language or framework or tools they were using. The state of DevOps survey results back this up. And also we know things like psychological safety are a prerequisite to this. So uh, having the scrum master or other leaders to help remove impediments is so important as we discussed on the chat. We need to have a lot of empathy. And finally, enjoyment. The modern testing call to action is an imposing challenge for some of for a lot of us. And you know, there's no reason to take it on if you wouldn't enjoy trying to use those principles. The satisfaction of helping your company and team succeed and growing that culture of quality, helping non-testers learn to build quality in, those are really hugely rewarding accomplishments that we hope that that I hope will add to your joy. Uh, back in the extreme programming days, we all agreed that the, the, there were four extreme programming values. And we all said the fifth one is joy or enjoyment. Also, humor and play helps us learn. Now, that's also been scientifically shown. So uh, we, need to, we need to take care of our own mental health and, and enjoy ourselves. So these are just principles. They're not rules. They're a guiding light. They don't go out of date when we get new tools or when somebody thinks of a specific time, well, that didn't work once. Well, yeah, but it's a principle. Um, I think at Janet and my, Janet's and my, my, Janet and I, if we wrote our 10 principles of agile testing today, we'd probably word them a little differently, but the same meaning would still be true. Whenever you have a problem or need to make a decision, refer to the principles to guide you, whichever principles uh, you can relate to. So my quality team wants our engineering teams to build quality in, take ownership of quality and testing, 
And so thinking about the principles, we, we want to lead the way in building a quality culture and helping them transition to better levels. So we're using a quality culture transition guide that we can explain to teams and help them track their progress, choose a couple things to work on at a time. It takes courage to do this, so we need to keep it as simple as we can. So, um, so just one last little activity to share in the chat. Are there any favorites among these principles that you hadn't, cons or anything you hadn't really considered so much before? We've already seen a lot of you had some favorites, but are, are there any more, or some that you don't agree with? Self-organize, yeah. Quality culture, courage. Everyone can test, yeah, it's true. Continuous improvement, really, really important. Data trumps intuition. Yeah, monitor all the things. I love it. I've really gotten into monitoring and observability because I've realized how important it is. And and we we testers are really good at spotting those funky patterns since something goes wrong in production. We're really good at asking questions about that data so we can explore the production data. Always learn and improve. We all need to learn and improve, whether you're a junior or you've been working for years and years. Focus on people, yeah, managers forget that. We gotta let people do their best work. Just remove the obstacles, let them go. Great, yeah, customer focus. I I know as a tester, my tendency is like, ooh, I'm gonna jump in and start testing where I think the bugs are, instead of, mm, let me start testing on the things that are most valuable to the customer, which is probably not the edge case. Automation, yeah, that's very important. Mm -hmm. It frees us up to do all these other human-centric activities. Okay. Well, thank you all for participating there in the chat. And I'm um I'm on Twitter. You can email me anytime. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm not so great at LinkedIn, but I'm there. Uh, I would love to hear your stories and share experiences with you. So please keep in touch. Uh, if you have any more questions and yeah, we've got the Q&A going on. And as I say, I'll share these slides. I, I'll send them to the organizers so they can share them with you. And here's some, some ways to learn more. I've just kind of covered the surface of these things. Um, but yeah, here's some more uh, blog posts and presentations and things that tools that you can use. And time for one more gratuitous donkey picture. And I will stop sharing my slides and um, go on to Q&A. Thanks a lot, Liza. <clears throat> it was a great talk. Uh, oh, I, thanks. I, I never saw these uh, principles, <clears throat> uh, agile testing and uh, these modern testing principles against like, like that, it's, um, it's very inspiring to, to see that. I got some questions from uh, attendees. So, first one, what advice could you give when a developer won't test? Um, this is a difficult one because a lot of times the reason they don't want to test is because their management is telling them, write the code write the production code, deliver features. And what I've found in my experience, they're a lot more likely to embrace testing when this, their managers say, oh, part of the skills matrix that you need to become competent in, in order to advance your career includes things like exploratory testing skills, test automation skills at different levels. And so, this is really a management problem. As long as management is saying, get to that deadline and I'm paying you for writing lines of code, so you won't get a lot of cooperation from the developers. The developers want good quality. They don't want to put terrible stuff in production, but a lot of the times they feel so much time pressure. So this is something you may have to take to your management or to your leadership. 
Uh, there's a book called Leading Quality by Ronald Cummings John and Oase Peer. Um, and it, it's how to, how to talk to your managers and business executives about quality, why it's so critical for the company's success, why they should make an investment in it, and then enable everybody on the team to get involved. Um, I know that's a simplistic answer. On a, a more low level, doable thing, one of the things I've found is just to ask the developers, hey, when you're finished with that story and you're about to commit your changes, may I come, may, can you just quickly share your screen with me? Now we would say that and walk me through what you've done. And then you may be able to do a little testing with them as you do that. So, so you can kind of introduce them with some people call that desk checking or show me, like show me what you've done. So there are some little ways you can just sort of start building a relationship with them. I hope, I hope those are helpful. It's a great idea <coughs> to do pairing with developers. Next questions, question is uh, from Arnaud. Which of the principles do you find the hardest for teams to adapt? Oh, that's a good question. Not, I, I'd have to look and I should have printed out my list of principles so I could look at them. <laughs> um, I don't know, because some of them are like, you know, oh, everybody would want to do this, but they don't necessarily do this. I, I, I think maybe even though everybody agrees that fast feedback is really, really important, I think people have a hard time really implementing it because so much gets in their way of the fast feedback. Like the fastest feedback is working in a pair or working in an ensemble and people don't understand it's faster. They say, oh, two or more people doing the same thing. That's not efficient and they won't do it. So some of the things seem counterintuitive to them. Um, and also because people struggle so much with test automation and having, you know, really fast automated test suites, really fast feedback from your deployment pipelines. Even though we all agree that we want feedback, I think it can be really a big challenge. Good. Thank you. Next question is from, I hope I say his name correctly, Halusen. How to convince, to convince a team to embrace a quality culture while this team is stuck in a waterfall approach? Yeah, again, I, um, I find the leading quality book helpful with this as well. Um, yeah, you have to remember, one of the things I've learned from Linda Rising over the years, and if you have never seen her talks, there are a bunch of YouTube videos of her keynotes, but she's a scientist and she knows how our human brains work. And unfortunately, we are not convinced by facts or logic, <laughs> even those of us working in software. This is why we have the political situation we have today. And, um, and so it's really important to, to realize how you can be a change agent. You can be a good influencer. And Linda's book with Marilyn Manns called Fearless Change, there's one called Fearless Change and one called More Fearless Change, has little patterns that you can do to influence. And so one of the things is to realize is there's a whole spectrum of people that you're working with and some are on your side, they're your allies. They're more receptive to your new ideas. And at the other end of the spectrum, those people are never going to adopt your ideas. They're going to be your, your haters forever. Get with your allies. Get with one or two allies. Start talking about, hmm, how can we get this change going? How can we reach out to the people next most likely to follow us and, and try our idea, embrace our idea? Uh, at, there are a lot of good patterns to get people on your side. Asking for help. If somebody helps you with something, then their brain has categorized you as their friend because they did something for you. Uh, one of the most powerful ways as humans that we can get somebody to agree with us is to do food. And that means really good food. If we can share food together because we're, we're social creatures, that's very effective. Now, how do we do that in the virtual world? I don't know, have good food delivered to, to everybody's house? I, <laughs> that one's a little trickier or just tell people go out to your favorite cheese shop and buy some really good cheese and a glass of wine and and let's go 
but but th there are a bunch of other patterns that you can follow to to have an influence have your elevator speech ready in case you get in the elevator with the ceo of your company those kind of things um but again bring things up in retrospectives make it a team problem to solve because your team has a whole bunch of diverse people who are really smart so bring up the problems that are relating to quality in your retrospectives and say, hey, what can we do about this? Is there some small experiment we can do to make this better? Yes, retro are good to, to embrace quality. Next question is from Claudio. What about measuring or having proper metrics to steer your testing efforts more efficiently? Yeah, metrics, that's a, that's a really tricky subject. Um, personally, I have found that the metrics from the state of DevOps um, survey, re what they compiled from the state of DevOps survey results that were the best indicators of high performing teams. And you can read about those in the book Accelerate by um, Nicole Forsgren, Jess Humble, and Gene Kim. But mean time to recovery, uh, lead time, time between failures, and the time it takes I can't remember them all. They're like four measurements. I can't rattle them off the top of my head. But those are kind of broad metrics that I think always apply. And otherwise, I think what you should do is form your hypothesis. What do you, what do you believe that you can change that will help with a problem? How will you measure that? That's really the hardest part. So, um, so coming up with, with goals first and then coming up with metrics to track your project to the goal. I'm not a fan of just saying, oh, let's count bugs or let's count this or that. Like, well, decide what you're going to count after you choose your goals. Thank you. Next question is from Anonymous. <laughs> um, if the team is self-organized, what is the role of Scrum Master? Yeah, um, it's actually been a really long time since I worked on a scrum team, but my best team ever was a, was a scrum team and we had a great scrum master. And I think maybe maybe with the new scrum guide, which I haven't read, uh, I think they've made the scrum master more, given them a better leadership position. But being a scrum master is more than maintaining the burn down chart and the, and the task board. Uh, it's, it's somebody who can spot conflicts among people in the team, difficulties, help them resolve those difficulties. Uh, of course, removing impediments. Uh, oh, I'm having trouble getting, you know, this operations person to talk to me and, sh and, and maybe she can help facilitate that conversation. And when we're having intense discussions on the team about, you know, how to design something or how to implement something or what should this new feature include, the Scrum Master is agnostic in terms of the technical implementation and things like that. They don't, they don't have a horse in the race. So they're better able to do a great job of facilitating. It's really important to have good facilitation skills for retrospectives, for any kind of planning meetings. And, and often we can look to the Scrum Master for that. Great answer. Uh, next question is from Philip. Um, which KPI can help us to show the importance of quality culture? That is a really good question. I guess, and I have not worked on a team that officially did KPIs, so I'm not 100%, I mean, I know what, I know what they are. But again, I would go back to the state of, to the metrics that come from Accelerate and the state of DevOps work, because I think that those are scientifically proven to correlate to high performing teams. And that's what modern testing is after being a high performing team succeeding with continuous delivery and deployment and the really fast feedback. Delivering small changes that are valuable to customers frequently, once a day, many times a day maybe. Um, I think that those metrics from state of DevOps are the most important. Yes. I don't know if they qualify as KPIs or not. Yes, for me the best KPI is the value we add to the customer. Um, Yes, one or two more questions. Um, one from uh, Julian. Any advice for quality with switching to modern testing? Errors not to make. Mm, that's a really good question too. I think I think having a lot of empathy for the team uh, and and lists a lot of 
work on your listening skills. This is something I always have to work on. But trying to understand what problems are people on the team feeling relative to quality and testing. And, you know, maybe start by how can you help them with their biggest problem and, and get them talking about that. So just being sensitive to you're not going to go in and change everything at once. So what is the small step you can take first and what principles will help you take that step? So. And don't be afraid to start. Yes, one more question. What is the most difficult skill to acquire to be good at in the modern testing? What makes a good modern tester? For me, the most difficult skill, listening to Alan and Brent and how they see a modern tester, they really think those data science skills are very important. And I've been, I got really interested in data science a couple of years ago and tried to really, you know, read, read up on it and try to learn about it. And what I found is it requires a lot of math. <laughs> I'm not great at that. Um, but I mean, I enjoy it. I can do some basic things. So I'm going to say collaboration skills are probably the best because I found, oh, our product owner is quite good at data science. And so I can pair with him and he can teach me things and he can help me get the data I want, even if I don't know how to get it myself. So building relationships, I think that's really the most important skill. Is that difficult to do? I think it can be It can because it can take so much courage. It's totally out of my comfort zone to have to keep reaching out to strangers at the company that I don't know because they know something that I need to know and don't know yet and, and I want to collaborate with them and so it takes a lot of courage and good communication skills, good collaboration skills to build those relationships. It's, it's really, but I think that's really a, an area to focus on. Katrina Cloakey has a great book called A Practical Guide to Testing and DevOps. And she devotes the first section of that book to building relationships, building bridges, with people on your team, people outside your team that can help you. Okay. <clears throat> I guess this is the last question. I check the time. Okay. A question from Pierre. What do you respond to someone seeing the <laughs> continuous improvement is existing, especially testing evolutions? That's a that's an interesting question. Yeah, um, I think that people. If you go, I don't know how many of you have gone to like a DevOps conference or a deliver continuous delivery conference. The message I hear at those conferences from almost every speaker of the ones I've gone to is one small step at a time. And so I think it's really important to, again, like I said, don't boil the ocean. Have the team focus on what's our biggest problem right now. And let's just try to make that problem 20% less of a problem. Don't try to even solve the whole problem. Just do something small, finish it. Focus on one thing, finish doing it. Now your problem's a little smaller, hopefully, and now you can move on to the next thing. So uh, yeah, I think you've got to take it. You, you, you need to go slow to go faster. People who focus on speed, teams that focus on speed, they make too many shortcuts, they accumulate technical debt, they slow down. If you focus on quality, and I've experienced this by being on high performing teams where we didn't deliver very much at first because we were focused on quality, our leadership, our business executives understood they needed to make that investment. And then over time, all of a sudden, we looked like amazing people, but it took a couple years because we had, we had a solid code base, we had a great safety net of automated tests, we had built up trust in the team, we had domain knowledge, and we were really rocking and rolling, but it took a long time. So it's worth making the investment. It's hard to get people to see that that's worth doing, but it really pays off. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yes, it's too short for the last question. If you want to answer <coughs> on your own. Uh, yeah, I'm so, gonna answer in the chat. Thank you, Liza, for your, for your talk. It was a very good pleasure to have you tonight. And, uh, <coughs> See you very soon, I hope.